Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We are starting now this series called The Journeys in Faith, uh, where we are going to explore the holy sites. Before going into the content, I would like to share with you um, one first reflection. This is a very famous passage of the New Testament. We are talking about the Gospel of Matthew. In the chapter second, we read the following. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. This is, very, this is the very famous passage of the wise men coming to adore Jesus when he was born. And we have also a few indications that will lead us through the process that we are starting today with this series. We might not be wise men. I hope among us, some of, uh, of the group are wise, but we might not be wise men. We might not be going to Jerusalem. I hope that some of you will actually go to Jerusalem or maybe you are already there or you've gone in the past. But what we can all share is to see this star. In the text of Matthew, we have these words also in the original text in Greek. We talk about the Magoi, those are the wise men coming from the east. And that word is used also in the book of Daniel to refer to the Kashidim, to the wise men that were advising the kings in Babylon. Those were the ones who can read the stars, but they also understand the deep meaning of it. Then we have this indication that they arrive from the east and they come to Jerusalem. That means that Jerusalem is a very important city to go. The star lead them exactly to the place where they will ask for the Lord. But God was not there at the moment. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So in our trip, we will visit Jerusalem, but we will also visit Bethlehem. And we have this sign that was shown to them, the star. In Greek is Eidomen Astera. We've seen the star. And I was thinking that maybe we can see that way the process we are starting today. We are following a star. We all want to have a better life. We want to improve probably our connection with the Lord and also with the Bible and with the Holy Land. And we are following this star that hopefully will lead us to a better understanding of the holy sites. So let's see what it means. In this first, first session, we will talk about Jerusalem. And in order to start this, I would like to first read this passage of the book of Job. A little bit of context might be necessary. Let's think about this the following way. In the first two chapters of the book of Job, we've seen how he has been punished by Satan. This figure called the enemy has come to, to the Lord and tell him, I will punish Job to show you that he is only worshiping you because you treat it well. Let's see what happens if these graces and these fortunes came to him. So all kinds of bad things happened to him in the first chapter, except one thing, he was healthy. Then there is a second conversation between God and Satan. And Satan says, yeah, he's still pricing you because he's still with health. What will happen if we hurt his health? Then he will, uh, he will curse you, he will refuse you. And he's about to. This is chapter three. And at this moment, this is chapter three of the book of Job. And at this moment, he is in a lot of pain with a lot of uh, wounds caused by this uh, sickness that the devil caused to him. He lost his family, his kids, his properties, his wealth, his health, everything. And then he starts this exclamation that I think is very, very powerful. And it could also reflect how we feel at some points in our life. It's a little long, but let's bear with me, please. May the day of my birth perish and the night that that said a boy is conceived. That day 
may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it. That night, may thick darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered in any of the months. May the night be barren. May not shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day. Those who are re ready to, ruse, to rouse Leviathan. May its morning stars become dark. May it wait for daylight in vain and not see the first rays of dawn. For it did not shut the doors of the womb on me to hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Wow, he's really, really about to refuse his belief in God. But he never did it. He only bear, he only claims to curse the day that he was born. Because he doesn't understand why all these things are coming to him if he is a good person. All these troubles of this suffering should have a meaning. We will not close the, this now. We will talk about Job by the end of this session. Right now, I think it's important for us to understand as we explore the heart of the Holy Land, that is Jerusalem, that the first idea comes also from this situation of suffering and this search for meaning. And we as pilgrims, maybe right now virtual pilgrims, hopefully one day also real pilgrims walking the Holy Land, we are also looking for this meaning, following the star like the wise men did. In today's session, we will talk about three things. Actually, we're going to talk about three stones, three specific rocks in Jerusalem. One is called the foundation stone and is the cornerstone of the world. The second one is Golgotha, and that might be the answer to Job. And the last one is an empty tomb and the plot twist of humanity. Let's start with this foundation stone. There is a very important text in the Jewish tradition. This is not part of the Bible, but it is part of the readings of the, of the, of the Jews, of the, of the rabbis, is in the book of Zohar, uh, in the section called Wayehi, that talks about the creation and the beginning. That's Bereshit in Hebrew which is also the, the, is the beginning of the Bible. And it's, it reads, The wall was not created until God took a stone called Even Hashetiyah and threw it into the depths, where it was fixed from above till below. And from it, the wall expanded. It is the center point of the wall, and on this spot stood the Holy of Holies. What do we have from this text? This is a very old tradition and it's talking about a stone called Even Hashetiyah, which we translate as the, the stone of the foundation or the foundation stone. And according to this tradition, there, that is the place where creation happens. It's the place that God chose as the first stone from which the world expanded and is the center point of the world. But we learn something more that is also the place where the Holy of Holies stood. That means where the Jewish temple was. So that's why we have to go to Jerusalem. We also know that this foundation stone can still be seen. It's there in Jerusalem. It's in the Temple Mount, in the place that Muslims call Haram al-Sharif in Jerusalem. And it is under the Dome of the Rock. That is the rock where the first temple was built, is the temple where the second temple was built, is the rock that Jesus walked around when he was in Jerusalem. And it's also the place where the third holy site of Islam was built. 
is decorated, is being uh, kept by the Muslim tradition, and we have this beautiful watercolor by Karl Haag in 1859, representing how it was in the time of the Ottomans. But today, where is it? Exactly. The rock is in just below the Golden Dome, in the place called Haram al-Sharif, in the Temple Mount. So we might need a little exploration about this place. If we go to a map of the city of Jerusalem today, we can see all the streets and we can see the light train and also we can see the walls of the old city that are marked in dark in the map. And if we go to the old city, where we have the, the, the walls of the old city surrounding, we also find the Haram al-Sharif, this explanade where the mosques are. The, the main mosque is Al-Aqsa in the southern part, but we also have this location called in the Jewish tradition, Mount Moriah. What is this Mount Moriah? Do we have any reference of it? Yes, we do, we do. We have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And this is a very important uh, reference. We are talking about the times of Abraham and he already had his son Isaac and he has this test done by God himself. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. We were talking about the foundation stone, this cornerstone of the wall, and we learned also that this is Jerusalem, and that is the place called Moriah in the book of Genesis. This connection is not an archaeological or historical connection. It's not, a, I would say, a, a carbon-14 proof that we can do about it because this is a text and the rock is a rock. The connection between of them should come from someone who was a witness and tells us that story. So the oral tradition went down all the way to the, to the, to, to today. And we have these references saying that that Moriah, that is the place where Abraham sacrificed his son Isaac, or to be more specific, where he went to sacrifice him. We know how the, uh, the story goes. And that is the place where the temple was built. So we have this event that is amazing, is the binding of Isaac. And we can think of Abraham as a new representation of Job. We were talking about the situation, the story of Job at the beginning, how he lost everything. But somehow this test is even harder because punishment was imposed to Job by, uh, by the devil. But now it's not the devil, it's God himself. And what he, he's asking Abraham is, not you allow me to sacrifice your son, it's you go and you sacrifice your son. I will say that this question is the most difficult ethical question in the whole Old Testament, in the whole Hebrew Bible, is the quest about what should Abraham reply? Should he say yes and be obedient to the Lord? Or should he say no and be obedient to the Lord, keeping the life of his son, which is the moral duty? So we see how he hesitates in his mind, but not in his actions. He took Isaac, walked all the way to Jerusalem, the city was not still there, it was just a rock. And he went to this foundation rock to offer his son, hoping that the Lord will do something. And we know that because what the Abraham said to Isaac when he asks, we have the fire, we have the, the wood, but where is the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham replied with faith in the Lord, the Lord will provide. And he did. He sent his angel and he stopped Abraham to killing his, from killing his son. And then an animal was offered and they live. So I will say we are going from something hard, like the life of Job, to something harder, the test of Abraham. But we will go deeper later. This place, that is the place of the binding of Isaac, put us in this track of history already. Because we were talking at the foundation stone, there is no historical proof about that. This is just a, an old, old tradition. We don't have a date to put it in, 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 the, in the timeline, 
we, we could actually say that if that's true, that is the beginning of any timeline, right? But now we move to something that for context, we can locate around 1850 BC, which is the life of Abraham. Abraham will be the first character in the Old Testament that has a very specific time frame and location. We know that he left Ur of the Chaldeans, that he made all his way to the north in Syria, in a place called Haran, and then he went down to the land of Canaan, where it, where it was promised to him, and then he went go to Egypt and back to Moriah for the binding of his son, and then finally he was sepulted in the, in the city of um, Hebron, in the cave of Machpelah. We don't have, again, we don't have a specific date for that, that, that figure, 1850, is a, is a more uh, general idea. When is the first time that we have the city uh, of Jerusalem appear? The city of Jerusalem appears for the first time in the narrative text, in this context. This is happening in the book of Samuel, in the second book of Samuel, and a lot of it has happened before Abraham and this. We are now in the times of David. Actually, 800 years pass away. What happened in the Bible was that the son of Abraham was Isaac. The son of Isaac was Jacob. Jacob was changed of name by the Lord into Israel. And he and his children went to Egypt. And then 400 years they spent there. And then Moses came to liberate them and went all the way back to the land of Canaan. And they start under the ruling of Joshua, the conquest of the uh, earth of Canaan, of the land of Canaan. But they didn't conquer everything. Some of the small parts were still to be conquered, even after the time of the judges. So we arrive to the time of the, of the first king, Saul, and he never conquered Jerusalem. Jer Jerusalem was still a city that belongs to one of the Canaanites group called the Jebusites. Who was the one who conquered the city of Jerusalem from the Canaanites, it was the King David. And we read this in the book of Samuel. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. So not only we have a location of the city he conquered, we have a very specific place that is the southern part of the city. In that time, that was the fortress, this fortress of Zion. And that was called after then the city of David, because that is the city that was built in the times of David. So Mount Moriah was a little up the north, which is a little bit more uphill and northwest from the city of David. It will be his son, Solomon, who will build the temple. And we know exactly the time of the conquest of David. We still have to find a lot of archeological findings. There are a lot of scholars doing that work. And we know that we can locate this in a very easy to remember date. It is in the 1000 BC. So now we can say from now till Jesus is a little bit more than 2000 years. From Jesus back to David is another thousand years. And from David till Abraham is a little less than 2,000 years. Sorry, a little less than 1,000 years, 2,000 years before Jesus. In that place, the temple was built. The temple was built as an expansion of the city of David to the north by King Solomon, the son of King David. And the temple was built in these different sections. Outside of the temple, we have the Mahanot. The Mahanot were the wheel carts with basins that will hold the water for the purifications. There is one for each tribe. Then we have something that the, the sources call the, the, the Sea of Bronze, also called the Yam in Hebrew which is the ritual by basin. In the gate, we have these big two pillars built in a very specific way called the, uh, the columns of Solomon or the bronze columns. And then we have this porch called the Ulam. After that, one will enter 
the holy site. The holy site is the Hechal in Hebrew, will be the main hall. But that's not the end because in that place we have the table for the breads that were consecrated. Uh, Jesus talked about those breads at some point and also King David when he was hungry will came inside and took those breads that were reserved for the priests. There is also the place for the incense. And then there is this gate that is covered with a piece of cloth, the veil of the temple, that is separating the main hall, the Hechal, from the Devir, the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, we will keep the Ark of the Covenant. The Holy of Holies is a place where only one person can enter, which is the high priest, and only once a year. And in the Ark of the Covenant, which is this big box, this Ark created in the times of Moses, and that was kept here, surrounded by these uh, angel, uh, angelical figures, uh, we will have that as the place where the presence of God is in this world. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, we will find, if we go in, in the times of Solomon, Solomon, we will find the, t uh, the tablets where we have the Ten Commandments, also some bread of the manna that ate, they ate in the desert was kept there, and also the baculum, the stick that Moses used to perform the miracles, was kept inside. And that is the Holy of the Holies. That is the most holy site for Judaism and for all this religion at the time and till now. But it was destroyed, right? Surrounding the Holy of Holies and all the temple, there will be a lot of chambers, these storage chambers, that will be kept for all the elements they need, all the resources they need to keep, the incense, the tools for the sacrifices, and also some uh, the clothes that the Levites need to use. What happened with this temple? The Temple of Solomon was destroyed in the in the times of the King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians in the year 587 BC. There will be this conquest by Babylonians and then the deportation, the exile to Babylon of all the Jews, or at least a huge percentage of them, and then they will claim to come back for decades. The exile lasted around 60, 70 years till the times of the Emperor Cyrus. And the Emperor Cyrus will send them back, will allow them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So that is the second temple. The second temple was built in the place of the first one. And that is relevant because the second temple is actually the one that Jesus saw. Something to bear in mind is that the temple of, of, of Jerusalem, the second temple built in the time of the Nehemiah and Ezra in the return of the exile was not as big as the first one and was probably poorer was not done with the same materials would not like the essential will be there but will not be as shiny and magnificent that it was the first one till the arrival of King Herod so in just a few years before Jesus uh, the King Herod Herod the Great did a lot of construction works around the temple and expanded the porticles and expanded the land and rebuilt a lot of it and decorated it a lot so so much that some people would say and we call it the temple of herods it's not because it was built by herod but it's true that from his own pocket maybe from the money he take from the taxes but he will build this temple and he will reconstruct the small or poorer temple from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And that is the temple that will take us all the way from the time of Jesus. With this, we will, we will go into the, into the last part of this conversation about the, the, um, the historical aspects of the city of Jerusalem. And something that is interesting is that when Jesus arrived, we keep seeing that the Jerusalem temple is the only place for worship for the Jews. We will say that you cannot perform any sacrifice out of Jerusalem and you have the obligation to go to Jerusalem as a pilgrim three times a year. There are some exceptions. I will say there are some exemptions. You don't need to go if you're sick or old or if you're very small or for some different reason you have to take care of someone but it was normal in the times of Jesus to go three times a day for the specific feast 
all the way to Jerusalem. Some people coming from close by, like the city of Modi'in, where there was where that's that's the city of the Maccabees, which is just a few miles from Jerusalem. Other people will walk for days coming from, from Galilee in the north, that's 200, 150 miles, and they will walk all the way in few days, few journey, uh, days of the journey to arrive to Jerusalem. But something that they all share is that they have to go up to Jerusalem because the city of Jerusalem is built in the top hill of this uh, place called Zion beside the Mount Moriah. So we have the city of Zion and the Mount Moriah, and that was the city of Jerusalem. It was expanded to the west, taking over all the place called the Valley of Kidron, and that is where also the new hill called the Western Hill will receive the name of Zion. And in that place we find also a very, very important holy site, which is the Holy Senate. So we will make now this, this time travel and try to go to the times of Jesus. We are talking about 2000 years ago, Jesus has been preaching in Galilee and, and he's been doing these trips during three years probably, going all the way back to Jerusalem for the, uh, for the feast and we'll go back to, to Galilee. At some point we know that he was crossing through the land of the Samaritans, which is not the typical way for a Jew to go, but even though it was a straight line from Galilee to, Judea, uh, to, to the Judean uh, region, but they will avoid it. And in this conversation with the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman will tell Jesus, uh, if uh, uh, not at the beginning, but he, she will she will say at some point, like we Samaritans believe that is here in this mount, which is Mount Garizim, that we have to uh, worship the Lord. But you say that uh, the Jews you say that you have to go to Jerusalem, and Jesus says something that is very relevant also to us, or at least is very important for the Christian tradition, which is this: like the times the times are coming where not in this mountain or in the other one, we will be worshiping the Lord. But the place that we will be worshiping the Lord is in our hearts. So this is very important because we see that after the beginning of Christianity, I will say probably after the destruction of the temple by the Romans, the Christian stopped doing that visit to the holy temple or to the, at the time, the planting wall, the wailing wall, for the, for the prayer. And that might be also based on this tradition. The Romans uh, destroyed the city of Jerusalem in the, in the year 70 BC, but let's not jump ahead of, each, uh, of ourselves because we have to talk first about what happened with Jesus. So we're talking about around the years 30, Jesus had been preaching in Galilee and he will go now to Jerusalem for the last time. He knows he's going to be sacrificed uh, there and he's talking about his glorification. In the Gospel of John, the word for the crucifixion is the glorification. And he is going there to be sacrificed in the time of Easter. The time of Easter, Easter was one of the three, three big feasts that the Jews has to celebrate going to Jerusalem. And specifically, they have to go and present the sacrifice of the Lamb, because that was the tradition all the way back till Moses. The, uh, the Exodus started with this ceremony of taking the lamb, sacrificing and using the blood to mark, to sign the doors of the Jewish families to avoid the destruction of the angel. And that must be done every year. Every year the families will gather and will do the sacrifice. Every year in the desert for 40 years, every year all over the, the land of Israel when they were conquering from the Canaanites. But since there was a temple, all the sacrifices need to be done at the temple. And Jesus said also something very interesting because he was presented by John as the Lamb of God. And he says something very interesting, like it, it is important that the prophets die in Jerusalem. Also, he's seen, his, he's seen himself as the, as the Lamb too. He will go to there. And there he will call for the disciples to gather for his last supper. The last supper took place probably in the house of Mark. It's also called in the tradition John Mark, and he's believed to have lived in the western part of the city, in the place called uh, the Mount Zion now. And there, there was all the good houses in Jerusalem. Very, very close was the place where the high priest was living. And we know this was a very... Uh, noble house. It has two different floors with a big 
uh, open space in the upper floor. The, we know it because the Greek term used is ento anagaio, which is the upper room, but it's an open up upper room, like to have a party, to have a, a big dinner, to have a, a celebration. And we also know that in that time of the year, a lot of pilgrims from all over the world, from all Judea, all Galilea, and also Jews from, uh, from overseas will come to Jerusalem. The city will become crowded at those times. So getting a house in the city center will be not easy if you don't, if you don't have these connections, these friends that will allow you to stay there. So Jesus will gather the disciples around this, uh, the table there. We cannot imagine the table as this is depicted by Leonardo da Vinci or the other big painters with this long table and everyone sitting in chairs around in one of the sides. That is, is a little anachronic. It's good for us for memorizing, but it's not how it happened. We know that in that time, in the times of Jesus, every meal in the noble houses will be had in triclinium, which are these small uh, couches, uh, like sofas, where they will put their elbow on it and they will lay on them at the distance hand from the table to eat. It were lower tables and they will dispose in a U shape. And around them, all the triclinium were gathered and the people eating there will be around it with the one doing uh, the most important guest or the most or the host of the of the dinner will be at the bottom, will be the one sitting in the in the middle. Jesus will have probably at his right hand will be Peter because he's his right hand. Also, because if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. If you are sitting on a table, but you, instead of sitting, you are laying on this sofa and you have to put your elbow to the side, what happens is that you have the back to your right side. So while you are eating, you will put your main friend, your right hand will be at your right. So he will cover your back during the meals. It's not that he needed to be covered at the time, but that was the tradition. You will put the right person, uh, the person at your right will be the one covering your back. And then at his left, we will have John. Now, the triclinium will be very close and they will lie on the sofas on this, uh, on, on, on this uh, divans, on this triclinium. So as they were lying, it was very easy for John just to roll a little bit the head and have his head over the chest of our Lord. Now, I think that this way of understanding the Last Supper helps us a lot understand how the narration in the Gospels come. For instance, Jesus will say at some point, one of you will betray me. And everybody will start saying, no, no, I will never do that. It's me or who is going to be. And then Peter, according to the Gospel, said to John by signs, ask him, what is that? Who is that person? Why was Peter asking John by signs? If they are sitting together, just ask. What was happening is that Jesus was in his side, giving the back to Peter with his elbow or the triclinium facing John. And now behind him, we will see Peter and he doesn't want to bother the Lord telling him, turn over to this side because I have to talk to you. No, he will just move up a little bit and ask by signs, can you ask him? So John, who will be with his head in the chest of the Lord, will look a little bit up and will see the, the signs from Peter and he will ask the Lord, who is that person? And he will say, is the one who eats from the, uh, from the plate that, that I am dipping? It was, they were very traditional small plates all over the table and they might be dipping in some of them as one do now. If you go to Jerusalem, you ask for a nice hummus, you will have some pita bread and you will dip in those, in those delicious plates of uh, hummus. So now, probably at the same time, some of the disciples were also gathering the used up plates or empty plates and taking them back to the side and bringing the new food. So even Judah will be one of those moving plates around and, and, and helping uh, with, with that task. That will also help us understand because we, we read in the gospel that then Judah came, took the plate, eat from there, and then he left. And when I was a kid, at least I was thinking, how can that happen? And nobody stops him. If Jesus said the one who eats from this plate and now Judah take that plate and eat from it, everybody should say, stop him, it's him. 
But no, that didn't happen. Probably because there was a lot of movement at the time, other people were helping, and they took the plates and he might be eating in his way out. Or he will take, yes, he will be one of more people receiving food from them, from, from that plate. So if we consider that way, it's easier to understand all these dynamics inside the Last Supper. Jesus will leave the Last Supper place with the disciples after the prayer and go to Gethsemane. Where is Gethsemane situated? It is out of the walls of the city. It is in the, in the uh, Mount of Olives, very close to the city, very few meters from the walls. But there is a, a walk of around 20, 30 minutes, maybe 40, if you go from the uh, place of the Last Supper to the place of Gethsemane. In that place is where Judah came with the soldiers from the temple to capture Jesus. Okay, we have done this whole trip from Abraham. So maybe we can talk a little bit about what is the actual situation right now of the, um, of the holy sites. So this is a, a small map of how Jerusalem looked like in the time of Jesus. We see the same explanate that we have been talking around. That is the Temple Mount. Now, there was this plain surface done by Solomon and expanded by um, Herod to keep the building that is in the middle, that is in the temple. And to the south, we have the lower city, which was the city of David, that city that David conquered. And then to the left, we have the upper city, which is more noble. It's physically up than the lower city, but it's also upper in the social class, it was very class. Actually, in the corner, we have the palace of Herod. And then we also have these two houses that we mark. One was the upper room, the house of Mark, and the other one is the house, the residence of Caiaphas, which was the, the high priest. So Jesus will go from the upper room, exiting through the lower city to the east, and will cross the Kidron Valley to the place called Garden of Gethsemane, which is at the east of the temple but just in front of it. Then he will be captured by the soldiers of the temple, but he will not be taken to the temple to be judged. He will be judged by the high priest at his house in the middle of the night. So he will be taken in the same way through the lower city to the way of the upper city, very close to the place of the upper room, which is the house, the residence of Caiaphas. So the city of Jerusalem went through a lot of changes and a lot of different processes after the times of Jesus. It was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. Then the Romans in the year 130, they put some uh, pagan temples over the holy sites they found, the places where both Christians and Jews were going to pray. So they built a temple for uh, one of their deities in the place of the Temple Mount, and they built another one in Golgotha. So we are going now to visit this other rock. We have been talking about the foundation rock in the place of the temple. And now we have also the rock of Golgotha. That place was uh, outside of the old city. And Jesus was taken there after the judge, after he was condemned to death by Pilate, uh, Pontius Pilate, which is just a few meters out of the old city, very close to this gate that is called in the Gospels, the Judiciary Gate. That, is, that path is what we call the Via Crucis, the way to the cross. From the Antonia Fortress, which is situated at the north of the Temple Mount, of the Explanade, to outside the city at the west in this place called Golgotha. In the times of Jesus, that place called Golgotha was just a quarry. This was the quarry where they took all the stones to build all the uh, buildings inside the old city and probably mainly the walls of the old city. But that quarry was already abandoned by the, in the times of Jesus. So imagine it's an abandoned quarry and there are different heights. Someone is like very, very deep. It's an open air quarry. They will take blocks from the good quality stone places and they will go in a, in a corp doing from maybe two sides. What happened is that at some point, a specific promontory in the middle of it remained untouched. And it happens to have the shape of a school. It happens to have the shape of a, of, of a calvarium in, in, in Latin, which is the, a, a human head with the eyes and the teeth and the mouth. So that will be the Golgotha, that will be the Calvary. And they use that as a place for crucifixion once the quarry was uh, uh, not in use anymore because it was in the way to the different cities. Actually, nowadays it's very close to this uh, road called the, the, the Joppa Road. Nowadays we call it Jaffa Road and that goes all the way to Jaffa which is the city of Joppa in the gospel, and it's actually today's Tel Aviv, 
to be precise, Tel Aviv grew around the old uh, city of, jo of Jaffa, and it includes the municipality inside the, the territory. So if you, if, if you were walking from the Last Supper place or from with the Last Supper place is also the place where the church started, right? where they gathered after the, the crucifixion and during the resurrection, there was a, an apparition of Jesus there. If you want to go from there to Tel Aviv, you have to take this road to Jaffa. And by the way, it passed through Emmaus. So the disciple of Emmaus will take this road going outside from the upper room where they were hidden because they were afraid of the Jews. They will exit probably around the uh, Herod's palace, which is the Jaffa gate. And they will use the Jaffa road or the, the way to Joppa to go to Emmaus, which is just a few hours away that way. We were saying that the Romans destroyed those places and built some temples. And then in the times of Constantine, we're talking about the year 313. And after that, the Emperor Constantine of the Romans convert to Christianity. And mainly he allowed, and not only allowed, he paid his mother, St. Helen, to go to the holy sites and rebuild those places actually create the new basilicas. And this is the place where we have the Golgotha. The specific place of the crucifixion was kept untouched, but everything that was around deep or higher was taken out. So the whole place were level at the, at the specific height and keep only the top of the hill of the Calvary outside of it. And a small courtyard will be built around it so the pilgrims can come in, walk around this courtyard and touch the rock and see there was a cross over it. So you have here this. So around this courtyard, we have two specific important things. One is at the right, that will be at the east. And is this basilica, this big building that was the place for the masses and the prayers. So you see, this basilica was a big one, five naves. And actually, if you go downstairs, you will find a small cave where the Holy Cross was found by St. Helen. This building was done between 325 and it was inaugurated in 335. And at the other side of the courtyard, something amazing happens is that at that side, we have the place where Jesus was buried. Jesus was buried at the other side of the quarry. And now in the in the tomb of Jesus, this small temple, uh, temple was built. It's called the Edicula. It's a small chapel over the place where Jesus was buried. That is the tomb of Jesus. And over it, a big dome was built. And that is the place called the Anastasis in Greek, which is the place of the resurrection. This is how this whole complex, since then called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but keep in mind, it keeps inside two holy sites. And, I mean, we can say even more holy sites, but these two main holy sites, which are the place of the Calvary, where Jesus died, and the place of the Anastasis, of the resurrection, when Jesus was buried and resurrected. This big basilica was destroyed in the invasions uh, from, the, uh, from the Arab countries a few years later, and was only rebuilt partially in the times of the Crusaders. The first uh, Muslim period was not hard on the Holy Sepulchre. The uh, Muslim invasion didn't stop or prevent the Christians to go and pray on their basilica, and the basilica stood there. But in the year 1100, a little before that, that date, the Khalifa Hakim, also called the crazy Khalifa al-Hakim, he decreed the destruction of the any Christian place. And the, the, this place of the Holy Sepulchre was completely destroyed. According to his chronicles, it was erased. No stone survived. According to the archaeology, that was not the case. We found remains from the times of Constantine, and we also find uh, remains from before Constantine. We actually did a huge uh, research. It was organized in 2016 by the Patriarchates, and it was supervised by all kinds of scholars, and a documentary came out of that by National Geographic about the tomb of Jesus. My, one of my recommendations, if you want to go deeper into this, is to go there. Because they went all the way till this place. So, as I was saying, uh, the Crusaders rebuilt the church, but instead of having the place of the tomb with the dome, 
then the courtyard, and lastly, the basilica. The place of the basilica was already destroyed and they built the new basilica over the courtyard. So now the Calvary is inside the, the church. And you see here, this is the place where you have the Calvary, the top of the hill. And then at the, uh, at the left, you have the new edicula, the new place of the tomb. So if you enter at the exact, exact same height of the floor is the place of the tomb. And that not, that's not by accident. When Constantine built the first basilica, I told you that he leveled all the place to a specific height. Which height was that? The height of the place of the tomb. So everything that was over the tomb, like the cave of the tomb, the coverage, was destroyed, was erased, and everything that was below it was filled. And now the whole basilica was standing at the height of the place of the tomb, of the tomb of Jesus. That uh, building is still the basic structure that one can see today when we go, but due to different earthquakes and fires and the pass of time also, uh, new uh, constructions or uh, reparations were done inside. Now we have a big chapel called the Catholicon that um, paradoxically is under the supervision of the Orthodox, not the Catholics. And then you have these chapels constructed over the place of the Calvary. So now in order to see the Calvary and touch it, you have to go inside the chapel and, to, and go up. And then at the left, we have the new edicula. And that edicula was built in the 1800s. So now this documentary about, uh, from National Geographic about the tomb of Jesus records all the process done in the last years, in 2016, 15, where they took apart every single stone there all the way down to the time of Jesus. Very, very organized, very well in order to keep track of everything. They clean everything, they organize everything, they map all the insights digitally, and then they phone and open the, the main block of marmor that was covering the tomb, and they reach the stone, the bedrock where Jesus was sepulchred. So this is also, and with this, I'm going to start my wrapping up of the session. This is also not only the third stone or big rock that we talk about today, that is also the answer to Abraham and the answer to Job. Because if we think of Job as someone who suffers, Abraham could tell him, okay, you are suffering, but at least you are not asked to cause suffering to others. I was asked from God to kill my only, my only son. Yes, but did he do it? No. He didn't have to kill his own son. Uh, he was safe from killing his own son. But who was not safe from killing his own son, his only son? God. In Calvary, the one who is sacrificed, doing the sacrifice of the lamb for the service of all the people, is Jesus himself, who is the son of God and is God himself. So the meaning for that suffering and that anxiety and then the, the old health problems. And I think that that is very interesting for us as pilgrims. As I was saying, today we are virtual pilgrims. Maybe in the future we'll be actual pilgrims going to the Holy Land. But even though now, today, I hope this helps also understand in faith this journey that we are doing. And that's also the look for meaning. To be a pilgrim in this life, pilgrim in, uh, life is a pilgrimage, we have to acquire a set of skills. And we also have to acquire an attitude, a specific way of seeing the world. And also we have to start in motion. So I like to define a pilgrim having three elements, heart, head, and hands. You have a heart because there is this star that you've seen in the sky and you want to follow. You are searching, you are seeking to find that place, but that's not enough. There is a second thing you have to, uh, to do is to put your mind to it. You have to think about it. That's also why we share some information to educate our knowledge about the holy sites, the Bible, their traditions, and how they are connected to us. But that's not enough. Now you have to use your hands. You have to put that in action. So those two things, those two elements are the skills or the development of a pilgrim. And if we want to be pilgrims in life and follow this journey in faith, my advice today is to go back to the gospel, go back to the Old Testament, read these passages. And then after that, also put your mind to it, change your attitude, have a pilgrim style of life, and then also start doing something about it. Start acting as someone who is searching for that star. Probably you all are doing this greatly. You are already pilgrims. And maybe we can also one day meet in Jerusalem and talk about these things. So we're finishing today's session. In one week, we'll have the second session. We will 
uh, we will go all the way to Nazareth and we will explore the echoes of the Annunciation. That's called the, the name of the second session. We will also go through some biblical and archaeological findings and try to put some context to the holy sites. Hope you enjoy this session and you come back to the next one. I, this session has been recorded. We will edit it and put it available in our platform, in crezio.org, in our website. Then we will also send you via email, at least for those of you who are registered, we will send you this and other auxiliary material the biblical reference, other new images and more material about this. And if you are interested in actually doing a pilgrimage, maybe you already signed up for one of, of the pilgrimages, we are organizing with different organizations some specific pilgrims to the Holy Land. So you are also invited to check our website and see if some of those will match your preferences or your interest and, we, and, and you want to join us for these sessions. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed and see you next week in this series of Journeys in Faith. Have a great week.